Good evening, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. I'm Belva Davis. Joining me tonight on our news panel are Jill Tucker, education writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, Howard Mintz, legal reporter for the San Jose Mercury News, and Tom Abate, business reporter at the Chronicle. And Tom, we will start with you. California does have one of the highest unemployment rates in the nation, but how is the Bay Area faring? Inside the California economy, the Bay Area is a little bit more of an engine. Uh, but I think the overarching thing to say, this is a very uneven economy from top to bottom, whether you look at it regionally, inside the Bay Area, a little bit better than the California's 12 plus percent unemployment uh, rate. Here in the Bay Area, from nine something, nine six in uh, San Francisco, the hottest part of the job market, Silicon Valley starting to heat up. East Bay still hit by housing and harder. Um, the rest of the state uh, depends on how close it was to the housing crisis. And of course, as we were discussing earlier, Belva, it depends on who you are in this economy. Are you a high school dropout? Are you a person of color? Are you in the inner city? Are you low income? Uh, are you male versus female? A very uneven recession. And the uh, men have been hit harder in this recession than women. If you think about who was swinging hammers, it was men. And they're now doing, they're now not swinging those hammers. 25% unemployment in construction. In places like Oakland and Richmond, where you have high African American populations, uh, nationwide, I don't know what the granular information is for here, but nationwide, as many as 45% of uh, young African Americans are, are unemployed. It's a catastrophe. So this emergency uh, is being seen through the eyes of uh, President Obama, and he is getting a lot of. Uh, uh, discomfort <laughs> from the remarks of his fellow Democrats. Well, uh, what's happening here, something that I, that I did recently that would be enlightening in this discussion is I went to Stanford University and I heard some very big business people talk about uh, what they saw about the world and they didn't feel the love from Obama. The business community feels that it is being vilified and put upon. I think very largely that this is a widely held fear uh, of feeling. And um, one of the uh, leaders was Steve uh, Jurvetson, a venture capitalist, and he said, the overarching problem, I'm paraphrasing, is income inequality. And this is a venture capitalist, and he doesn't particularly want to see an interventionist government policy, but what's happened in the last 20 to 30 years is increasingly a society of haves and have-nots in this recession. If you happen to be, as uh, Steve Jurvetson said, if you speak the lingua franca of technology or biotechnology, you're golden. However, if you worked with your hands, if you had a service job, if you had a manufacturing job, you've been scrounging. So, and, so why are the Republicans, who are often supported by business, why are they pushing so hard for these continued tax cuts um, to the wealthy, it, which theoretically is going to affect a very not small just, number of people? It's not just the wealthy. and I, I, It's really important here. We've got to start to find common ground. And Sunday, I hope that uh, Bay Area readers will take a look at something that we're going to put in the business section of the Chronicle of the soul searching in economics. There is not yet a consensus among these smart people who missed the crisis, let me, let's say that, about whether or not even things like the Obama stimulus were a good thing or a bad thing, and whether the tax cuts are a good thing or a bad thing. Now, I tend to believe that right now, I'm, I'm more aligned with the Keynesians, or I've seen more of the Keynesian argument from Christina Romer at UC Berkeley to say, this thing was so deep, so big, that if you're going to give it a jolt, you're going to give it a big jolt. Well, the Democrats got their jolt, and they did it their way. And I think if you want to look at it cynically or practically, the Republicans are going to get their jolt, and they're going to do it mostly their way. This time. Every month, there's another set of statistics that come out on job numbers, hiring. <clears throat> it's dizzying. There was even some dispute this week about the accuracy of various sets of numbers. We seem to be stuck in neutral. I think that's probably uh, where we are right uh, now. And so the, the question is, I mean, what do we read from the latest numbers? Is that dangerous to even do? Because these things don't change in a month. Well, I think that um, neutral is a little better than where we were a couple of months ago. We started the year pretty strong, and everybody was really optimistic. And then we hit some period in the uh, spring, uh, April, May, June, things started to slow down. Activity, I think, is heating up, and a lot will depend on how strong or not this holiday season is, right? 
uh, a lot of the retailers are expecting a, bet, a, a decent year for the first year in several years. And if that happens, we'll go into 2011 with a little more confidence, a little more dynamism. But the thing is, this is not a recession as in, gee, demand fell off and now we're going to slowly call it back. This was a complete reordering the financial system. Uh, it's a complete reordering of the manufacturing and distribution systems. And with the health care, one of the things that the business community talks about is with the health care plan coming on, whether you support it or not, it creates uncertainties, it creates new mandates, and everybody freezes and pauses. Well, go going back to the original question, how, how is the Bay Area or California in general poised to sort of absorb this new world or economic order in terms of, you know, we're not going to get that manufacturing back. We're not going to well, have some of those. Oh, well, so all of it, yeah, all of it. Mm -hmm. But it, it, are we ready for whatever's coming well, next to have the jobs, to that's have? That's part of what when, when we talk about education in the Bay Area. So here's our blessing. Um, we do have some of the really the best minds and the most dynamic sectors of the economy. San Francisco is really cooking. If you know what Ruby on Rails is, probably no, but if you did, I could get a bonus for bringing you into the right store in, in the right shop in South Park. Uh, this is a web development tool. So San Francisco is totally alive as the place where you create the user interfaces that are going to attract millions of eyeballs to some application online. Uh, Silicon Valley, the, the, you know, the South Bay, uh, reading more encouraging things about the making of widgets. We're not going to give up, by the way. We're going to make them. Uh, the East Bay, I'm a little bit lagging, I'm afraid. You, you mentioned the unemployment rate among uh, minority youth and particularly African Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, some people see this whole job crisis through the eyes of a civil rights actions being needed or that there needs to be some rules changed. And so we move to another story that has to do with civil mm -hmm. rights, not to do with jobs, but to, to do really with human rights. And that is the story uh, behind Proposition 8, which continues to live on through the courts. Uh, this week we saw a milestone in that case. Yeah, it, it's, and it's going to live on for some time. Uh, three appeals court judges heard arguments in the case. They're considering uh, the August decision by Judge Walker here in San Francisco that found Proposition 8 unconstitutional. Um, we spent Monday's arguments sort of reading tea leaves, as we often do when they hold these hearings. Um, the Ninth Circuit is notoriously liberal. This panel's a bit of a mix. Um, one thing was abundantly clear. Uh, th this is not a panel that appeared inclined to find Proposition 8 constitutional. Um, in one form or another, um, they were finding problems with this law. The question is what path they're going to take. They can go from the most expansive view of this and really set this up for U.S. Supreme Court review on the ultimate question, which is whether same-sex couples should have a constitutional right, equal right to marry, which is the fundamental issue in this case. Or they could go to the most narrow, um, and that is whether the sponsors of Proposition 8 really at this stage of the game have a legal right to be in court. You know, so. Uh, which I actually think is one of the most interesting aspects of this, that currently none of the defendants are actually fighting <laughs> for this. So that's sort of the, is that, how did the judges react to that situation? Do they have to rule on that first in terms of we're going to let you fight this or can they just sort of say we're going to, we're going to address the constitutionality even though technically the defendants aren't here? They're going to have to address that issue in order to get to the constitutional question. In one fashion or another, they're going to have to deal with that. Um, we're, we're in this odd posture. Uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and Governor-elect Jerry Brown as Attorney General have declined to press this appeal. They agree with Judge Walker's decision that this law is unconstitutional. And they're not here. They're not in court. And that's created this odd posture in the case where there is a serious question about whether the sponsors of a ballot initiative have a right to defend a state law when the state won't defend it. Is there, a, how common or uncommon is it for the Supreme Court to tell the voters no on a constitutional amendment? Um, in terms of the U.S. Supreme Court jumping in here at some point? Or the, or the state Supreme Court, which is, well, you know, is or the, this, this is already this at the is federal the appeal. Yeah. This is the federal level. We're done with the state level. <clears throat> 
Um, the, the Ninth Circuit, it's not uncommon for the federal courts to step in and find that a state, even a voter approved law, violates the constitutional rights of the people. I mean, that's what the federal courts are there for. Uh, one of the judges at the uh, hearing the other day said to the Proposition 8 lawyer, um, well, what if the voters wanted to reinstate segregation in schools? I mean, could they just do that because it's a vote of the people and that's what the majority wanted? And, you know, it was, it was obviously a rhetorical question because, you, you know, even the Prop 8 lawyer is like, no, this is different. Um, so it would not be unusual for this court to find that Prop 8 is unconstitutional. We're, you know, this has all been set up as a, a path to the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, and, and how it gets there and whether it gets there is really the end game here. Yeah. But it doesn't seem the way that people were talking after the hearing the other day that even though this is now in the federal path to the Supreme Court that this would necessarily be the case that creates a national right. policy or law or legal precedent right. for gay marriage in every state. It still looks like that this whatever happens at the end of this case is going to be a very perhaps localized decision that affects California only? Again, it depends on the path the Ninth Circuit takes. They can go narrower. They can, for example, say California, uh, the Cal Proposition 8 stripped away a prior right that had been established in that state Supreme Court ruling of 2008. Or they could say, you know, we find that this is a violation of the federal constitution, equal protection rights. That ruling alone would apply to nine Western states. Mm -hmm. And it would invite the Supreme Court in, and it, you know, if the Supreme Court rules on the on the fillet of this issue, that will obviously apply nationwide. When, when, will, when, will, when will we know? My guess is decision. there's no deadline for the Ninth Circuit, but we will probably hear from them in the first quarter of next year. I would imagine by springtime, mm -hmm. and then either on to the Supreme Court or, or not. It won't be over there. That's for sure. Well, we were talking earlier about uh, education and its tie-in to the jobs issue and the dropout rate for minority youngsters. Jill, tell us more about that. Well, the, the, the newest dropout rates came out this week. Um, they're actually a year late, so we're talking about data that goes back to 2009 because the state has a new system for counting and they had bugs in this system. But what they found was that overall 22 percent of high school students drop out before they graduate. Um, that's up three points probably because we're counting them slightly better, maybe not necessarily because of a worsening situation, although that's possible. But the real numbers that came out that, that um, I think shocked a lot of people were the, the dropout rates for minority students. African American students, for example, are at 37 percent, <coughs> almost, you know, almost 40 percent, which is a, a very, very shocking, crazy number to even think about, and 27 percent for Hispanic students. Asian and white students are, are much lower than that. Um, so it really, uh, I think when, when people saw these numbers, 37 um, percent, it, it really is, um, it's just shocking and to think. And then you have the repercussions down the road. I mean, if these kids are not getting a high school diploma, they're the ones who where are, are unemployed be, during the next recession. Where are they possibly going to work? question, Jill. I mean, where, where, what's who's tracking this? I mean, is anybody tracking this? What becomes of these kids? I mean, where do they go? You know, it, it, we've looked at this and we've done some stories looking long term what happens to these kids. And, and the reality is this number goes down. These, these kids don't all stay as high school dropouts or, or non-graduates for their whole lives. A lot of these kids come from poverty and violent neighborhoods and a lot of things. And their path to graduation isn't a straight shot from right. kindergarten to 12th grade graduation day. Sometimes it takes them longer. Sometimes they leave and come back. And what we found is a lot of these kids eventually do graduate, but it does leave this gap and this question mark about their future if they're not graduating on time, they're not graduating with their peers. It's a lot harder, I mean, you can imagine, to go back to school once you're older. Jill, you've been reporting on these numbers for a number of years, right, on this program. It's hard to find who's accountable. It's hard to find even a study that people can agree upon. After looking at it all this time, some of your thoughts about where, or what have you written about that says, you know, how do we stop this hemorrhaging? You know, the first thing that came to mind when I saw these numbers and everybody sort of opened their mouth, put their hand up and went, ah, oh, shocking. And I thought it was shocking last year too and the year before and the year before that mm -hmm. and all the times that I've been on the show going, oh my gosh, look at the mm -hmm. rate. Um, you know, I think 
Uh, the schools obviously take responsibility to a certain degree. Um, Jack O'Connell, the state superintendent, was pointing the finger at budget cuts. We don't have the summer school so these kids can make up courses. We don't have career tech to get them interested in school or art or music or all those things that really help kids find that joy in, in school that they might not find in an algebra class. So could we say that the recession has something to do with this because you know, of the budget cuts I, it's possible. at all different levels? Yeah, these numbers were bad before. They're probably worse, slightly worse now. So sure, a recession is going again, to make it worse. Unevenness is the name of the game, and what's mm -hmm. happening is America is not the fluid climbing society that it was, and it's getting harder when something breaks, once people fall out this decisively and this large. And even again, if I go back to where does the where does a kid get his first job or her first job? It's from a neighborhood merchant. That's where we got mm -hmm. them from. And if you go into those poorer communities, you don't see the neighborhood stores. You don't see the infrastructure that's out there to help these kids go the right way instead of the wrong way. I would way. imagine the budget would play in where State there's budget. not well, yeah. e there's not enough resources to intervene when right. they're in trouble. We were talking earlier right. about you get to junior year or senior year, you're so far behind because right. you don't have summer school, you don't have this. And, and I think it's important to state, it's, I don't, it's not the school's fault per se. I mean, they're not forcing these kids to drop out. They care very much that these kids don't drop out. Right. So it's society issues and things like that. But I think ultimately the schools are the, the place where they have to address it. And right now they're saying they don't have the money. So we, we're seeing that we have a recession, we have high unemployment, and we have high dropout rate, which all sort of these moves are, around and, in and a circle. These and kids are our next unemployed. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, my thanks to all of you for joining me here tonight.